Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, as we continue to learn to live with certainty. Today we're going to be exploring loneliness, isolation, seclusion that's forced upon us. To be sure, these things run counter to the human condition. It's hard to imagine that anybody really hopes to be alone or would seek out loneliness. Certainly the vast majority of people seek relationship, friendship, family, and a social circle. But just because we desire those things doesn't mean we're necessarily going to get it. Even if we place our full trust in Hashem, as articulated in the previous episodes. When Rabbeinu Bechaya begins to discuss relationship, or specifically the lack thereof, we kind of cross a bridge or turn the corner on the highway of Betachen. Unlike the ideas talked about in many, many of the previous episodes, where a person is able to bring blessing into his or her life by virtue of their trust, by ridding themselves of anxieties, worries, and concerns, by living with certainty, because they have betachan and Hashem, we've learned that you actually open fresh opportunities. You bring blessing into your life. Having betachan, for example, that Hashem will provide for you necessarily brings you that blessing of prosperity. However, when it comes to relationship, this is clearly not the case. Here, in addressing the lonely person in his or her pain, Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar is very clear in stating that having full hope and trust in Hashem isn't necessarily going to relocate you to a place of family or friends or materialize a social circle for you. Maybe it's because it involves others as well. Or perhaps that's just the way Hashem ordained it to be. That is to say, He necessarily accepts upon Himself, that is God, to provide for all of His creatures. For as as long as we will live, we will always have our basic necessities met. But Hashem never makes that promise. He never assures us or gives a guarantee that the same will be true insofar as having the privilege of a social circle and vibrant relationships. So what is the Betachen approach? in that situation. Rabbeinu Bechaya explained to us that it's really about inculcating an attitude, a perspective, learning to view the world through betachen eyeglasses. And the betachen perspective or vision, the attitude of absolute reliance on Hashem with regard to relationships is such that you must trust that Hashem knows what's most conducive for your own success. He knows what's best for your neshama's mission. We all have a purpose. The question is whether we'll succeed at the purpose that God gave us. (laughs) The answer, as they say, is in your hands. However, God oftentimes provides us with a wonderful set of tools 
Sometimes he makes it more difficult. And sometimes Hashem arranges things so that the circumstances are readily available. The tools or mechanisms we need are literally within arm's reach. And we simply have to rise to the occasion. Living with that kind of certitude, that if I'm alone, it's because it's best for me, enables us to cope successfully. In the previous episodes, Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar gave us several important and true things to reflect upon. He explained and elucidated the idea that, in truth, none of us are ever alone because Hashem is always with us. It's a very real thing, although it might not be intuitive or natural or instinctual to feel. But we can, if we work hard, appreciate Hashem's presence that is with us at every time and in every place. A person doesn't have to rely on others who will, quote, have their back or look out for them. Because even somebody who's alone ultimately is in Hashem's hands. And the truth is that even people who rely on others to have their back are ultimately in Hashem's hands as well. So from a betochen perspective, having a sense of security because you have a network of family and friends who will help you is actually foolish. We should be secure and relaxed because HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Almighty God, will always be there for us. Sometimes it's through a network of family and friends. Other times, Hashem will find His way. We just have to be prepared and ready to embrace and accept the help that Hashem sends us in any way, shape, or form it comes. The third detail is that despite the unnatural nature, hmm, that's like a double redundancy, but seriously, despite the seemingly unnatural position of being alone, there is an inherent part of us that should be quite comfortable with aloneness. On some level, we're always alone. Alone in a journey because our neshama, our soul, is bereft of its habitat and its environment. Deep down, every one of us will oftentimes feel a profound sense of lonesomeness. Because for all that it's not amenable to the human condition to be alone, it's actually a part of the human condition. If you have questions about anything I just shared over the last five minutes, please go back and view the previous episodes. Because we spoke about this in great detail with many, many cross-references and a variety of proofs and explanations that Rabbeinu B'chaya offers. Today, as we move into the final thrust in addressing loneliness, there's one fourth short point that we kind of briefly mentioned, but I don't think it was articulated fully, so I want to do that right now. The Yachshev Belibay. Rabbeinu B'chayah says, you must think in your heart. Ki kol mi sheyesh Anybody who has the privilege of relatives or family here in this world, adzman muat yoshiv nachri. It's just a matter of time before he becomes a lone stranger. Boded. Isolated, secluded. Veloi yoi lehu karev. No relative can help you then. Veloi ben, no child. Veloi yeschaber imai echad mehem. And you won't be accompanied. You won't have the presence or friendship, the companionship of any of them when that time comes. So what is Rabbeinu B'chai talking about? 
a person has a loving family, a wonderful circle of children and friends, lots of support. What does he mean when he says, it's just a matter of time. You'll end up alone in the end. Well, the Mepharshim explained that Rabbeinu Bechaya is actually talking about the time in which a person leaves this world. So when the time comes and you have to leave this world, invariably, you're going to end up alone. And that's because, as the Mepharshim, for example, the Pas Lechem says, Death comes a lot more quickly than any of us really expect it to. Va'achar moto, and after one's earthly or material demise, yoshev el you return to dust. You don't have friends in the dust. Va'az yihyeh nochri min mishpachte. When people are buried, they're buried alone. They're boded, they're isolated. And he says... The meaning of velo yo'i lehu is so what lasting benefit does all the companionship and friendship bring you? One's destiny is to be alone. Ultimately, uh, alone before God. And so if one is to be alone before God and when a person comes before the heavenly tribunal, when he stands before Bezdin Shalmaila, after his earthly passing, you don't get companionship. You don't have anybody to come along or accompany you on that most difficult of journeys. Nobody speaks up in your defense and no, you can't get a lawyer. On that day, we are alone. And so Rabbeinu Bachari is kind of driving home a fourth and final point, namely that we're going to be alone in the end. I guess you may as well get used to it. <laughs> it isn't that bad, because that is a person's destiny. The Tova Levanon says something very interesting. He says, suppose a person lives to a very, very ripe old age. In if you live for a very long time, well, then you'll end up burying your children and your friends. And then a person is alone. V'yashuv mishomam uboded bitzar. And then you're kind of left with tremendous sense of isolation and loneliness. I've seen this tragically. Older people who've had children predeceased and their friends gone are literally alone in the world. It's an awful situation for a human being to be in. And if you don't live that long life, well, what is it that you obsess over relatives for? The Tova Levanan says, neither of these scenarios is great. The latter is worse. So this is kind of sobering. I don't think it's the stuff that joyous music is made of. It's a healthy dose of realism. It's a coping mechanism. But here I want to point out that there are many coping mechanisms in the world. Many of them are fictitious. I mean, Viktor Frankl himself, in his magnum opus, Man's Search for Meaning, confesses to you that he himself was sustained with a meaning that was fictitious. He kept himself alive because he believed his wife was alive, but unfortunately, she had perished in the gas chambers. And then in his own words, when he discovered this, the days after liberation were worse than incarceration. The point, of course, is that when people create fictitious stories, tales, and narratives to comfort themselves, they're always going to be in danger because that fiction can have its cover blown. <laughs>
And even if somebody could manage to live with fictitious kinds of thoughts or ideas, is that really a comfort? Perhaps on a pragmatic level. But if one thinks deeply, that perhaps the things he or she is comforting themselves with is actually not true. It's cold comfort. All four things Rabbeinu Bachaya has spoken about have the good housekeeping seal of Torah truth. They're all authentic. It is true that we are never alone because Hashem is always with us. It is true that ultimately we only have Hashem to rely upon. It is a fact. It's true that there is an inherent part of us that is lonely. And lastly, even when we have the privilege of companionship, it's a joy that's short-lived. And so Rabbeinu B'chayi says, ruminate upon these things. Think about them. And don't allow your situation or circumstances to bring you down. Having said all of this, the question then becomes, but why do I have to suffer the pain even if it's temporary? How could this be a good thing? And I want to be quick to point out that there are certain circumstances in life that we cannot tell ourselves are good. We bow our heads in submission. We have a faith-based attitude. It's called Tzidduk Adin. We have to accept upon ourselves Hashem's judgment. And sometimes there are awful situations. I got a terrible message today, awful message from somebody who I've never met but watches these classes who shared with me some an awful terrible tragedy and his question is so how do you make that into something good of course you don't the death of a child by negligence or forgetfulness is never something that we can rationalize frame in a positive light and try to find silver linings for So to be sure, there are situations, awful situations, terrible situations, where we're not supposed to look for silver linings. Loneliness isn't one of those. It's not our first choice. It's not our ideal way to live. But if that's the way you're living, not by choice, but rather by divine dictate, embrace it. And understand that it may be the most powerful and poignant way for you to fulfill your destiny. And it can ultimately, therefore, be a great chesed, a great kindness and benevolence from Hashem. Now, if you're out there watching and you're lonely, I don't mean to make light of your suffering. Chas v'shalom. Who am I to tell you? It's okay when I have so many gifts and I personally have the joy of family and friends. But Rabbeinu Bachai is saying it. Here's the tzaddik speaking words of Torah truth. So let's open our hearts and our minds and let's try to absorb and ingest and personalize his message. Especially for those who are actually in this set of circumstances. Rabbeinu Bakaya here introduces the words once again with thoughtfulness. And it's staged thoughtfulness. First is the four things he wanted you to think about. Certainly, the last detail opens up the words with the idea, the yachshev belibay. And he must think contemplate with an understanding heart kind of an emotional quotient of sort but now he leaves the word heart out and he says think about this this is cogent this is actually 
This is actually logical. It's not something you need to feel as much as something you need to think about. Logically, to come to the conclusion that he's making a point. And this may end up being a great benefit. How? Says Rabbeinu Bechaya, and afterwards he should contemplate, bring to mind or think about the fact that behistalkus koived masa'om the voisom, that with the removal or him having lifted from him the weight of people's loads, the weight of fulfilling people's needs. that he's had a weight lifted from his shoulders. It's quite fascinating to note that when we speak about responsibilities towards others, the term weight is used in the Torah. The Paslechem says, Rabbeinu Bechaya's choice of the weight of the burden is not happenstance. In fact, it was Moses himself in the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verse 11, this is Parsha Bahalotcha, where he feels the heavy burden of responsibility to the nation. And he says, Lasum esmasa kol ha'am, to have loaded this heavy burden upon me. Or in Parsha Yisro, where Moshe Rabbeinu's father in law is suggesting that he delegate and enable others to carry the load with him because it's too burdensome and overwhelming. He says, V'nosu itoch, they will carry the burden with you. So whilst we're not speaking here about a physical density or weight, it has become common since the days of the Chumash itself to refer to the burden to the challenge and difficulty of responsibility metaphorized as weight. Even in English today, people say, a weight is lifted from my shoulders, or I'm carrying a heavy load. Oftentimes, the load we carry isn't the load of our own needs, but it's the people we're responsible for. And the more people you're responsible to and for, the more burdensome or the heavier the weight is. Here's a person who has no friends. Here's a person bereft of family. Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says to him, don't you realize that a weight has been lifted from your shoulders? Of course, it's a weight that you accept upon yourself willingly and perhaps even joyfully. And certainly it brings you a sense of satisfaction and nachas. But it's still a weight. And it's the weight Hashem wants us to carry. So if you're able, you must be willing. But if for whatever reason Hashem, Almighty God, ordains that you not carry that weight, well then you should take joy in the fact that a weight's been lifted from you. just so you can have an easier life? That's a poor argument. Because a person will say, well, I don't want that kind of easy life. I want the burden of maintaining my marriage. I want the burden of helping and raising and providing for children. So Rabbeinu Bechaya comes back with the word V'yachshev again. He says, that's just the first thought. It's a part of of this bigger picture. V'yachshev, and he should further think, zet tova mitovot habore alav. This is in fact a favor. It's a goodness that God bestows upon him. Why? Mipnei, because, or for, she'im yihye roidef achad in yoni ha'elom v'tzrachov, when a person is in pursuit of worldly matters, so then, Invariably, yigiato yoser kala alav mibli isha ubanim. 
if a person's bereft of family and he has the burden lifted from his shoulders, he should consider that to be a benefit. Because chesronam, the fact that he has a life that is absent of these burdens, menuchalo, vetova. It means he has more tranquility, more peace. And that equals goodness as well. The Batlechem so beautifully elucidates these words. He says, the fact that this person has an, a vacancy, a void in his life that he doesn't have spouse or children or relatives means that he has respite from the many responsibilities towards the people he loves. But not only does he have respite, there's a tova, there's a benefit that he has. And that's, of course, because, as Rabbi Nochaya is going to explain to us, the reality, the reality is that if a person doesn't have these burdens, then he or she can focus on a higher calling for life. The goodness is in such in miyim vakish, in yone acharito. So that if this person decides to devote himself to the pursuit of his end, this is a euphemism for the world to come. It's a, I suppose, the way somebody might refer to eternity or the afterlife. Yihialibo yotereik uponui. His heart will be emptier, clearer. He'll be, he'll be freer to spread his wings and to soar spiritually. Be'et it bodeduto me blisofik. At his time of solitude, and this is really something that is beyond a shadow of doubt. Now, that doesn't mean every lonely person is going to be more spiritual. And it certainly doesn't mean that every lonely person is going to be more effective at living the kind of life that brings him into a better or higher eternity. In fact, we would argue that when one gives to somebody else, that is the greatest merit. Yet, the fact also remains that when a person is burdened, There's a limit to how much time you have, how much energy you have. I oftentimes explain to people, when they ask me why they shouldn't do A, B, or C, isn't it also good? And my response is simple. God only gives you 24 hours in your day. The average person has to sleep a significant portion of that, somewhere between six to eight hours, You have to find time to eat. You need to relieve yourself. There's basic cleanliness and grooming. And then there's the various other things that menial chores that we're required to do. How much time do you really have when all is said and done? And then you have responsibilities to others. You're actually obligated towards your spouse or your children which could sometimes leave very little time for spiritual pursuit. By the way, (laughs) that's the way Hashem wants us to live. He wants us to discharge those responsibilities besimcha over tuvlevav with a sense of joy and happiness. We should delight in and and find happiness in, in the lot that God gives us rather than grumble or complain about it. But if a person, for whatever reason, has had the privilege of these relationships removed, then they must say to themselves, I have been given a gift. I have much more time, much more space, emotionally, intellectually, and quite literally, to devote myself to spiritual pursuit, to, if you will, build eternity of the afterlife. Or, Although Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar doesn't say it openly here, I have more time to make an impact in this world. 
So it may not be the conditions of your choosing, but it may not be bad for you. After all, not everything we like or even love is good for us. And there are lots of things that we don't like that are extremely beneficial. I mean, you could start with healthy food. Most of it doesn't taste nearly as good as the unhealthy stuff, but it's a lot better for us. So if a person isn't given the privilege of tasty food, he could either complain, this is inhumane, to eat food that has no taste. It's not, it's not normal. Or he could say, wow. So now the burden of cuisine and delighting in food has been removed from me. Now we're not talking about food now and it's a bit of a diversion, but I'm just giving you a metaphor or an example of another thing we relate to, another basic need we have. Rabbeinu Bahaya isn't suggesting for even a moment that we don't need or shouldn't want and crave relationship. The Talmud says that. That's exactly what Adam, the first human being who was actually comprised of two people but didn't find contentment in having two faces. It's exactly what he yearned for. And the human condition is such that we constantly yearn for companionship. Yet, if Hashem takes it away, we can find a silver lining. And now, to drive the point home, Rabbeinu Bechaya says, do you know that there were even once upon a time people who would voluntarily embrace this kind of life? He's not suggesting you should, even though he's writing this nearly a thousand years ago. Where Purushim, these people who sought seclusion, were considered to be somewhat common. People would withdraw from society, withdraw from family life, withdraw from their social networks, and remain entirely fixated and focused on their own personal spiritual pursuit. To be sure, the Baal Shem Tev rejected this entirely. But as we're going to see today, that has to be understood. There's a little nuance that has to be f- applied or kind of framed if we're to understand this picture right. So you may not look for the loneliness. You may not want the loneliness. You certainly aren't being advised to embrace the loneliness, but there is a silver lining. And the proof of the pudding is that there were people who actually sought this out. Valkane, how you have Prushim, therefore there were these individuals who would withdraw or separate themselves. Aesthetics, or ascetics as they're called. They would flee, burchim mekrevehim, escape or flee from their relatives. Umibatehem and from their homes or households. And they would run el haharim, run to the mountains. Kidei, so that their heart could be emptied or made open, create room in their hearts for the service of God. So these were people who felt that without secluding themselves, they wouldn't be able to succeed at their own spiritual pursuit. Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says, Not only is this something that some people may have sought, but in fact, there was was a time when certain exalted individuals necessarily had to embrace this way of life if they were to live up to their mission, if they were to embrace the mandate that Hashem had placed upon them. And Rabbeinu Bechaya here specifically is now going to refer to the prophets. I just want to remind everybody who's watching that if you're on Facebook, I strongly suggest you come onto YouTube because there's a live chat. And if you ask questions, I will try and read the questions and respond to the best of my ability. 
So that's just a little suggestion out there. I, I appreciate everybody's smiles and hellos and, uh, and the kind words. But in all seriousness, if you have questions, please pose them and I will try and respond. And I want to remind you that it's a great idea to subscribe and enable notifications to youtube.com forward slash Shabbat Mendel Kaplan. And my website is fully operational as we continue to augment and perfect it, rabbikaplan.tv. Okay, end of commercial break. Says Rabbeinu B'chayev, V'cheinu ha Yohanavim bizman ha And so too it was for the prophets. At a time where prophecy was a part of our normal, everyday national experience. It doesn't mean that it was normal or everyday for ordinary people or everybody to have prophecy, but there were prophets amongst us. In the same way that today there are rabbis amongst us or scholars amongst us, there were activists amongst us. What's well, not everybody. Once there were prophets amongst us. The Gemara talks to us about a time when there were thousands of prophets amongst millions of Jews. The prophets we know of are the prophets whose messages are relevant and meaningful for posterity. And that's a subject for another day. And so it was that the prophets during the time of prophecies would leave their homes. They would leave their places of residence and they would seclude themselves. They would make sure to be alone so that in isolation they could contemplate and think of how to actuate their responsibility towards Hashem. You see, when a person has special gifts, that comes with special responsibilities towards God. If somebody has a special mind, a brilliant mind, then he or she has an obligation to utilize that mind appropriately. When you have a talent or a gift, it's Hashem providing you with a venue, a mechanism, a, a convention through which you can make this world a holier, happier, and better place. So it makes you more responsible, not just more privileged. Because every privilege, from a Torah perspective, is actually a responsibility as well. If you have the privilege of wealth, then you have the responsibility to provide for those who are impoverished. If you have the privilege of scholarship, then it is your responsibility to share the ideas and ideals that you've been fortunate to absorb and so on and so forth. So here's a person who has the gift of prophecy. It's an incredible thing. Here's a person who's very close to or in touch with God. A person who's living with a higher inspired consciousness. Well, then he or she has a sacred duty and a responsibility towards Hashem. And oftentimes, in order to realize that responsibility, he or she would be best secluding themselves and thinking about that responsibility. Rabbeinu Bachai approves this. After all, he never claims to be a prophet. He doesn't tell you, trust me, I know all about this. But he says, if we look at the scriptures, we can actually see paradigm and example. We know that Elijah the prophet is instructed to seek out Elisha, and he will become his eventual successor. In the book of Kings, we hear in the 19th chapter, the 19th verse, about Elisha, who is busy plowing up a large tract of land. And he has shnei masar tzmodim. He's got 12 pairs of oxen before him. Vahu b'shnei masar, and he's on the 12th. So there's like rows of this plowing mechanism. And Elisha's walking at the end of the row of the oxen, because uh, he's the owner of the field, or the one in charge. Sometimes the person who's responsible has got to be out in the front, and oftentimes the person who's responsible has to bring up the rear. When it comes to plowing, you need to be behind everybody to make sure that the entire tandem is moving forward appropriately. So he was the foreperson, if you will, the one responsible to oversee that the plowing gets done right. And there he is, behind this parade of oxen, 
and workers, man and beast, plowing up the field, and Elisha walks over to him. And what does he do? Well, the scripture says, Elisha, Vayaver Elio, pardon me, Elio walks up to Elisha, Vayashlich Adarte Elov, and he casts his cloak, which was a special garment or raiment that prophets would wear, upon him. Why does he do this? Well, he's kind of intimating to him that you should become a prophet. You've been chosen. You're poised to enter a new phase of your life. Our sages tell us that in doing this, Elio, Anavi, Elijah the prophet, was able to kindle or illuminate Elisha's soul and to transfer to him some of his paranormal wherewithal and ability. And as it were, somehow, this seemingly casual act of casting a portion of his cloak upon him profoundly affects Elisha. And there's like a bond, an instant bond formed between the two. As you'll see, Elisha responds instantaneously. And he wishes to cleave to Elio. And he knows it means taking leave of his family. So Radak tells us, Losha Ozovetzlo, he didn't leave his jacket on somebody else. He kind of almost like intimated something by casting a corner of his cloak over him and then he went away. But something stirred within Elisha. And Vayara Tzachari Elio, we hear that he runs after him in verse 20. Vayazav Esabakar, he leaves his responsibility. He just kind of neglects the oxen. Vayara Tzachari Elio, he's running after Elio. And what's the first thing he says? After, as Radak tells us, Asali Simen Shigelech Achrov, Elio Anavi was essentially giving him a sign, a sign that he should follow him, a sign that he somehow understood and responded to. Ki Yoda, he knew, Elio knew, Shiyoven Ki Mehashem Yonavi, that Elisha would immediately somehow understand. And he did. He knew that Hashem had placed it in Elisha's heart. He knew that Elisha would follow him. So he just made a casual sign. He didn't pursue him. He didn't woo him. He just slightly initiated this relationship and then walked away. And then, and, and, and then Elisha runs after him and Elisha says to him, I want to be with you. I want to follow you. However, before I do that, he says, I, I just want to kiss my father and mother. Goodbye. And then I'm going to follow you. Elisha is a wonderful son. He loves his parents. Any parent wants to be, child wants to be with his or her parents, but Elisha knows that if he is to follow Eliyahu, if he is to become a prophet of Hashem, he is necessarily going to have to kiss that life goodbye. And so, he, Elisha, returns, comes back to the oxen. As the story goes, he takes the pair of oxen with which he had been plowing, he slaughters them, and he cooks the flesh, and he, he, give, he makes a fire with the equipment and he makes a meal. He distributes it to the other workers and to the rest of the local residents who somehow understood that Elisha was no longer a simple farmer. That somehow he became a prophet. And our Mepharshim say that through this act of slaughtering the oxen and burning the farm materials, it was as if Elisha was kind of cutting the cords to his past life as he enters into a new life of powerful prophetic intuition. So Rabbeinu Bachaya says, Kivan Sheromaz Le Elio, Bimaat Remez. Elio gave him the slightest hint. 
Haven, I say. He immediately understood him. Intuitively, he knew. Va'omar, he said, Ashokun, Allah, Avi, Li'ini, Elcha, Acharech, I'm going to kiss them goodbye. I'm coming after. Va'omar, and it says later on, Va'yelech, Achare, Elio, Va'yashaseo. He follows Elio, Anavi, and he serves him, and life changes forever. What does this tell us? It tells us that in order to experience prophecy, Elisha, and likely those around him understood that he couldn't continue to have the pleasure and the privilege of ordinary familiar relationships. He was going to separate. He was going to have to go into some kind of conclusion. Now, Rabbeinu Bechaya isn't advocating this, but he is making very clear that there could be a silver lining to a person being in a state of isolation. And then Rabbeinu Bechaya shares with us this fascinating thing. He says, It was said of one of the Pirushim. It was said, That he enters into a, a province, a region. And, and when he comes to this uh, certain city, This was a spiritual leader of sorts. He was disengaged from life on a personal level, but he certainly wanted to minister and give to others. This is not the Purushim that the Baal Shem Tev argued against. This is a person who very much wanted to reach out and teach others and believed in that. But he was a person who also favored seclusion. Vayim Tzoyim, he found that they were Lov Shem Tseva Echad. All of them were wearing the same color clothing. B'mal Bushehem V'tachshitehem with their clothing and accoutrements. So it was like everybody wearing the same thing. And another thing he saw was Kivrehem Eitzel Pischei Batehem that their graves were already near the homes they lived in. Now whether this means those who had lived in these homes before were buried there or whether they actually had prepared graves which is a huge subject of whether a person is permitted or it's appropriate to dig one's grave before one passes is a subject of discussion. Some want to prove from the scripture describing Yaakov Avinu's excavating of his own grave. And he says so clearly. Others maintain that's only for great tzaddikim. It's a subject that's beyond the purview of our betachen points now. I, I, I actually once gave a class on this in Parshas Vayiga Shavayichi. If you go to Parsha Curiosities, I, I, I did some research on it and, and shared it at the time. But the point is this. Whether, whether what they did is, is, is conventional or even laudable or something we expect others to do is, is not the thrust of what Rabbeinu Bechaya wants to say. He's just describing, he's giving you the whole picture. He's just telling you the whole story. This is what he found. And he also, he saw that there was Leiroa Bnei Amisha. There was only men living here and there was no woman amongst them. Nobody seemed married. Vishalaisamaza, he he asked them, he says, guys, what, what exactly is going on over here? W- what is this? Masha Anu, uh, you, you, you're all wearing the same clothes. Nobody makes any kind of fashion statements here. And they said to him, Masha Anu Leif Shem Tseva Echad, the fact that we wear kindred clothing, Shalayyon Nikar Ha'ani Min Hasher, so that the wealthy person shouldn't be seen as different, separate or apart from the rich. We're trying to erase any disparities between people. So there's two things here. We don't want the poor person to feel disparaged and we don't want the rich person to get carried away with his beautiful wardrobe. Then the poor person feels denigrated, scorned or disgraced. Life on this side of the ground should be like existence on the other side when you're pushing daisies. Now, that sounds ridiculous. Why would you want to be a living dead? The Mepharshim explained, it's not about being a living dead. It's that everybody gets buried in the same shrouds. In Torah culture, we don't have fancy shrouds or different shrouds. The shrouds are always made simple. That's one of the takanot of the great Rabbi Gamliel. So as such, they said, rich man's grave, poor man's grave, a grave is a grave. All of humanity is really deserving of the same dignity. But we want to remind ourselves of that. Because it's a nice theory, but when everybody's dressed differently and people are making fascist statements, as some are well-coiffed and well-dressed and others aren't. They're wearing shabby clothes, 
or torn raiments, well, then there's an obvious disparity between people. So we want to erase that disparity. So we dress the same, which is clearly very unnatural. And the proof is that in just about every civilization or culture we, we are aware of where people wear clothes, they wear different kinds of clothes. It's natural for people to want to dress beautifully, and it's also natural for people to want to dress differently. When a person joins something like a, a law enforcement agency or, a, or an armed forces, a defense force, or firefighters, there's an element of surrendering your individuality. You're becoming part of a conglomerate. There's a price to pay. It's necessary because these kinds of forces have to work as a team. And everybody has to shoulder the burden and responsibility. And of course, there's people who have a higher commanding level. And yes, the uniforms do change and the accoutrements change. But when people are living civilian lives in which they don't surrender their individuality, they don't want to wear the same clothes. Even in parts of the world where people didn't wear or hardly wore any clothes, they had all kinds of adornments. And they wore various accoutrements to distinguish themselves, beautify and enhance their appearance. So these people said, well, we want to kind of de-escalate the differences between people. We want everybody to be living in the same sense of quiet, humble dignity. V'nemar al-echad mehamalachim, it is even said of one of the kings, Shehoi Yemesarev ben Avodov, he would mix amongst his servants, he wouldn't wear royal robes or raiments. Why? He would behave in a very humble way when it came to clothes or fashion statements. Now, of course, Rabbi Yaakov Emden is quick to point out that according to Torah, a king has to be distinguished, set aside, treated differently. Otherwise, by virtue of what will be, he be able to kind of lead or control, that's the job of the king. True enough, he says, but it doesn't have to be with ermine or purple robes. So whilst this is a person who at the same time had to be presidential and had to be afforded a certain honor and respect by virtue of the position he occupied, but there's still an element even for a Torah king of layorum libimechot, that his heart should never grow proud or stout. And one of the easiest ways to get carried away with yourself is the clothing you wear. Sometimes clothes do make a man or woman. In fact, oftentimes, we react as we dress. We behave in accordance with the style that we've embraced. So by doing this, the people wanted to embrace a different kind of humble, quiet, and dignified life. Now, it's really important to emphasize that Abena Bahaya isn't suggesting that this is the kinds of life any of us should choose. He's just telling you a story, a matter of factly. And he says, Ma shesamnu kivres meisenu eitzel peschenu, the fact that we have graveyards right at the door, which th- seems to indicate maybe it was people who had lived in the past, but the graves were literally at the door. Also very unnatural. Typically, for Jewish people, the graveyard is always outside of the city. There's a variety of reasons for this, some of them technical, because at a time when the Jewish people were trying to live according to the Torah, they needed to keep ritual purity. And having a graveyard at the door isn't very effective if you're trying to keep a state of ritual purity. But this is probably speaking about a time in the post-Temple era where people were no longer able to observe the laws of ritual purity. And it's still unnatural. But they said, we did, we did, we did this, today so that we will be, if you will, rebuked by it. This, this will be something that constantly serves as a reminder. It's a reminder for us. It, it, it reminds us that, you know, everybody's going to die. And if everybody's going to die, we should uh, take this to heart. And we should try to be prepared by living a holy life, a life of tshuva. So v'naz lanu hatseidah ha we're just making provisions, or we're 
preparing. We're preparing for that journey. And one doesn't prepare for that journey with tuna fish sandwiches or bottled water. For this you need tshuva. You need Torah. You need mitzvot. And we want to get to that place in peace. And then the final point is this. You asked us to, where are our families? Where are our wives and children? He says, Die, you should know. We haven't shirked our responsibility. We built them a city. There is a village. And whenever we need to take care or fulfill our responsibilities, we go do what we have to do, and then we come back to this aesthetic kind of strange village. Because we saw from the various burdens that can fill and overwhelm a person's heart. And how so much of time gets spent or swallowed up. And the tremendous toil of Atayrach Bikirvasam and the toil and effort that's expended in maintaining these relationships, that it's a tremendous distraction. It's an enormous loss. It's something that is enormously taxing for us. And then, conversely, we saw he calls it, we have experienced or tasted the serenity and the inner peace by being away from them. To choose instead the pursuit of holiness. And to disdain, if you will, the realities of the everyday world. And here is Rebbein Abachaya's point. The Yitvu Divrehem Be'ene HaParosh. The parish said, you have a point. He didn't tell anybody else to do it. It doesn't say he adopted this lifestyle, but he said, I can understand. He blessed them. He said, this is your way. It's your approach. You have, you have the right to choose this if you feel it's how you can best serve Hashem. And he, in a sense... He encouraged them or approved of these practices. Unfortunately, we're all out of time because I have to be speaking, I have another online speaking engagement. When we come back, Bezrat Hashem, I'm going to shed some light on how we view everything we just learned, especially with the illuminated perspective of Torah Sachasidus. And is this really something any of us should choose with Hashem's help? I will clarify and elucidate in an upcoming episode. In the meanwhile, may Hashem bless each and every one of you. May we not have to comfort ourselves because we suffer from loneliness. May we all have the privilege and the gift of wonderful relationships. Spouses and children and grandchildren, cousins and relatives and friends. And may we together merit to serve Hashem b'simcha uvatuv levav and all be reunited with the coming of Mashiach, Bimheira, Ubi Amen, speedily, and in our days, Amen. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.